All right. Well, good morning, and thank you all for joining us uh, here for a quarterly public safety update. Uh, we're looking to do these quarterly uh, to get information out to the community on uh, what's going on uh, from the city side and also to uh, make uh, requests of the community how they can help us uh, address uh, violent crime in particular in our city. And uh, this is, we know that uh, violent crime ha has a lot of root causes as well, and there are longer term strategies that the city uh, is uh, working on. That is not the focus of, of these updates. This is uh, more of what are the direct intervention strategies, what is, what is our law enforcement doing, and, and what are we working on with the community to, to get these numbers down. Um, we're also uh, hopeful that uh, as we're coming out of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, cases are starting to drop here locally and, and across the, the country. And uh, we know that so the public health emergency um, is hopefully passing here for good. And uh, the economic emergency, uh, the economy is, is recovering, uh, you know, stronger than, than many of us would have thought a couple years ago when the pandemic began. So the economic uh, emergency is starting to move in the right direction, although there are some growing pains, of course. Uh, but now we have, uh, we'll, we'll be still dealing with the social emergency that has arisen from, from COVID-19. Of course, our numbers uh, of violent crime were higher than we would have uh, wanted to see pre-pandemic, but uh, South Bend and across the country, uh, what's happened over the past two years, we've seen a rise in, in violent crime. and so. These things, uh, there are a lot of root causes and, and other things that are, that are driving that, but we know that the, the pandemic and the dislocation and some of, of the uh, issues there have, uh, have been a cause of this, and we will be dealing with this for, for uh, you know, as the public health and the economic uh, pieces resolve themselves, this is a longer term thing that we're gonna be dealing with for some time. And so uh, today we've uh, got a, a good panel. We've got uh, our chief of police, Scott Ruskowski, We've got our Assistant Operations Chief, Dan Skibbins, our, our GVI uh, uh, Coordinator, uh, Isaac Hunt, and uh, Lieutenant uh, Kayla Miller, and she'll be talking about uh, Crime Stoppers. So, well, again, this is focusing on, you know, what are we doing in the short term? This is how do we, how do we get uh, and maintain peace in our streets, deliver justice for victims, and get these numbers down. Uh, obviously, there are a host of other things we're doing that, that we'll have other venues to, to discuss. And, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Chief Ruskowski. All right, thanks, Mayor. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you can remember the slide number or the slide title, we'll come back. We'll open that up to questions, and then we can revert back to that slide if you have questions on that. We want to try to move through this um, at, a, at a good pace where it's comprehended um, because this is a little bit robust. It's something we haven't done before, notably. Uh, the mayor talked about this about a year, or year and a half ago, um, to do something like this from a public safety perspective, kind of like he did with the pandemic updates. Um, with that being said, there was a challenge to the police department, several other entities, uh, more, more notably would be our um, INT department, uh, specifically Kelsey. Uh, she worked her tail off to get to the point we are with uh, some of the numbers and, and stats that you're, that you're about to see as well. Um, when we talk about transparency, that's one of the things, like just look around all the other law enforcement agencies in this area and we are the most transparent department that there is. Um, with that being said, apparently at times that's not enough. So with that being said, this is why the mayor challenged us to come up with maybe a little bit more robust updates. So besides, a, besides the Board of Public Safety, uh, Common Council uh, committee meetings, uh, neighborhood um, groups that we attend either, either in person or virtually, um, and a host of other things, which will be addressed later. That's one of the things that uh, I, we're going we're gonna to put this forward and see, but I would, I would highly recommend that you all, please, uh, most of your questions can be answered from our transparency hub, whether it's use of force, how many arrests, how many cases, uh, how many criminal assault shootings we've had. Uh, all, all those things can be answered right, right then and there on that transparency hub. And I think that's all I, I have right there. So next slide. So we did that data review. We're going to do that strategic initiatives and programs and then events and engagement. And that, that, that will be a, a more conversation than just a, a one note on the slide. Um, but we want to make you aware and part of, the, part of our quarterly updates are going to include what our intentions are, whether it's the mayor's office or the police department, 
actually combine mayor's office and police department, things that we will be doing in our community so you all know, people will know in advance and can meet us there. So, uh, a topic of conversation that seems to not go away. As you know, October 15th of 2021, we took over the homicide investigations. Uh, since then, we've had five homicide investigations, six victims, five incidents. We have named or known or apprehended a suspect or persons of interest in every one of those cases. Um, I'll leave that there for right now. There may be questions later on, but I just wanted you to be aware. Um, that's nothing celebratory. Those, those five incidents, six victims should be zero. However, um, our shooting response team and our violent crimes investigators uh, have done a phenomenal job. Uh, very seldom sleep, um, but they're out there doing their doing their due diligence. Uh, and, and this weather is not helping matters either um, to to bring justice for our families and our communities. Um, notably, below this, as you can see, uh, the special victims unit they'll continue to investigate and prosecute uh, child physical and sexual abuse. Uh, with that, when we talk about physical abuse, it's parental only. I, I want to be clear on that. Um, and as you see up there, they will investigate everything else. So we still will continue with the uh, domestic violence cases. I don't know what our number is right now, Kayla. I'm not sure if you have that. But I, at last, uh, at last week, it was uh, 45 cases. 43 had been resolved as, as of last week, uh, early last week. Uh, next slide. So to highlight off of the... Uh, homicide investigations. Michiana Crime Stoppers released uh, in January that we will be upping our reward for tips leading to the solving of a homicide investigation from the historical $1,000 to $2,500. So this is a significant increase. I want to be clear that this is on investigations only. So if somebody has a warrant that is related to a homicide, that does not qualify for that up to $2,500. That is um, just on the investigation itself. So the question gets asked quite frequently, does Michiana Crime Stoppers work? And it does. In 2021, there were two cases of homicides in which Crime Stoppers tips led to the solving of that case. And since 1983, when Michiana Crime Stoppers began, there's been a total of 108 homicide cases resolved. There's been a, a total of almost 11,000 total cases that tips from Michiana Crime Stoppers has resulted in either the case being resolved or the uh, suspect being picked up with their warrants. Since in 2021, there was 167 arrests that came from Michiana Crime Stoppers tips, which is up from 2020. And since 1983, there's been over 8,300 arrests made. In 2021, there was over $37,000 in rewards paid out by Michiana Crime Stoppers for information that led to the solving of a felony crime or the arrest of a felony fugitive. And since 1983, there's been over $1.1 million paid out in rewards. So yes, it works. We also want to encourage our community that if you have information on a felony crime or a felony fugitive, which would include our homicides, that you can call 574-288-STOP or 800-342-STOP. Your tips are always anonymous from start to finish. So it's up to you as a tipster to make sure that you're contacting Michiana Crime Stoppers back to find out whether or not your tip resulted in an arrest. Obviously, we can't call you back because we don't have caller ID and we don't track IP addresses. And the last item for Michiana Crime Stoppers is that there is a gun violence proposal that will be discussed at our February Board of Directors meeting. What does that mean? Uh, Michiana Crime Stoppers has been vigilant over the last several years, especially, to ensure that we are doing more for our community, more for Michiana, and more for South Bend. Uh, we know that gun violence has been on the rise across the country and in our community, and we want to do more. So there will be a proposal at our February meeting that would be uh, to address gun violence incidents specifically and have a designated reward amount for that that would be a significant increase from years past. Um, if that is approved in our February meeting, we will have more information um, after next week's meeting. 
and then I will turn it over for data review. Yep. Good morning, everyone. We're getting into uh, the next agenda item, which is data review. I'm going to cover a couple slides and guide us through those. Uh, the very first one we have is just a snapshot. It's uh, comparing 2021 to 2020 with gun violence that we've seen in the city. And as you can see, we did have an uptick, a substantial one. What is that, what are we referring to when we say gun violence as a whole? That's everything from even an intimidation with a firearm uh, all the way up to someone being actually struck by a bullet. Uh, other examples I can give you would be a car struck by a bullet, uh, a drive-by shooting where a house is struck by bullets. Those are all gun violence. Uh, they fall into that category. So you can see we have had an uptick there. Moving down into that middle column, we have 133 gunshot victims in 2020 compared to 121 in 2021. That is about a 10% reduction, and that's not something we're proud of or happy with. Being over 100 shootings is, is a bit absurd. Um, working on gun violence reduction, the last three years we've been over 100, and our goal is obviously to be below 100 and even further down than that. As the chief has said before, uh, any shooting is too many. One's too many. So being over 100, we're not proud of that as a police department, so we don't want you to think that we're trying to polish a stat here. Uh, but we did see a 10% reduction compared to last year. Hopefully five years from now we can say we saw a 10% reduction with criminally assaulted shooting victims each year. Uh, moving into that last column, you can see our officers uh, performed well out there doing work to try to reduce gun violence. 440 guns were taken off the streets by our officers in 2020 compared to 603 in 2021. That state's illegal guns were removed. So that, what that looks like is a gun that was involved in a crime or a criminal act occurred and that's why the police confiscated a weapon. Moving into our next slide, it's a bit more detailed. Um, I'm going to start off with uh, talking about the trend. So since 2014, you can see in the bar graph there, we've seen an upward trend in gun violence. So that's, that's not gun violence, that's fatal and non-fatal shooting victims. You can see an upward trend there since 2014, especially in the last three years, as, as I have said. Moving down a column, um, off to the left there, you see non-fatal group member involved shootings. So I'm going to explain a bit what that means, group member involved shootings. When we have someone struck by a bullet, our investigations start in right away at the street level and then are turned over to the detective bureau. We work to identify if the victim, the suspect, or other participants, those who were maybe around the victim uh, when this incident occurred, if any of those individuals are identified as being a part of a violent group or gang, we deem that incident to be group member involved. We abbreviate that to GMI oftentimes when we're talking about gun violence. And you can see in the bar graph that we do have a high percentage that are GMI with our shootings in the city. Um, off to the right, the pie chart shows 62% of those since 2018 have been GMI incidents. And while I'm, while I'm in that column, I'll just slide over. That's an outline of the city of South Bend broken down into districts. Uh, the darker the shade in that district, the more GMI shootings we have seen in that district compared to the lighter shaded areas. Moving up, we'll see 85% in that pie chart are non-fatally shot individuals in the city compared to 15% fatal since 2018. And again, that outline of the city of South Bend there shows you the darker shaded in is where we've seen more criminally assaulted shooting victims in the city of South Bend. Moving into the next agenda item, we have strategies, programs, some initiatives. Uh, moving into Shot Spotter Connect. At the end of each year, we evaluate ourselves, uh, the command staff on the police department, and evaluate what our pros and cons were for the year, strengths and weaknesses in our overall gun violence reduction strategy. So we're looking for ways to improve upon that. We saw uh, a weakness for sure in 2020, and that was with regards to resources, actual sworn officers. We saw a higher rate of people retiring and resigning from the police department, and a lower rate of people applying to be police officers. So our numbers dipped dramatically from upper 240s to uh, into the two teens. We needed a way to um, efficiently uh, deploy our resources out into the field and have them in the areas where they need to be, where we've seen gun violence or just crime in general, but specifically gun violence is what we're talking about today. So one of those tools offered to us by ShotSpotter is ShotSpotter Connect. So we reviewed that, the chiefs and I sat down and discussed the need for ShotSpotter Connect. What that provides us is an unbiased, evidence-based uh, way to deploy our resources to put officers in those spots where they need to be. 
who is utilizing that on the police department? It's our patrol officers, the patrol division. The officers assigned to beats, those who are responding to calls. Um, they're assigned to regions within the city. We're divided up in four regions. Um, our northwest region has five officers. Our northeast region has four officers. And that breakdown is throughout the city. There's usually a supervisor in each of those regions, but sometimes because of our low numbers, a supervisor may have two regions that they're supervising. Within those regions, uh, the officers are getting shot spotter missions, and that's how they are deployed resource-wise. They go into those missions. So getting into the how, I'll talk about that here a little bit more specifically. Each day at 6 a.m., uh, 24 hours worth of case reports are pulled into the Shot Spotter Connect system. The system evaluates three years worth of historic data and those new recent reports that were just updated. Any crime trends for one, two, or three weeks are weighted heavily towards the Connect system, which then creates missions for the officers out in the field. Our officers in patrol have laptops in their cars. The software is on that laptop. There's a map that shows up and diagrams uh, mission boxes for the officers to spend time in. We ask that our officers spend f uh, three 15-minute intervals in each mission. And that's not, they don't have to do that in a singular mission. There are several missions per region, actually six total. So the officers are asked to spend 45 minutes in a mission per day and to make that a variable time. So we don't want them to spend 45 minutes all at once within a mission. What does a mission look like on the map? It's anywhere from two blocks wide by two blocks long. Um, the largest mission that I've seen, I think, is about four blocks by four blocks, but they're relatively small, generally two blocks by two blocks. We ask our officers to do uh, random things within those missions, change it up. Uh, foot patrols, things of that nature, this weather isn't necessarily good for foot patrols, but when the weather breaks, we'll definitely have our officers out there in the mission boxes doing more foot patrols. This also gives us an accountability feature. Those uh, directives, those missions that are out there are outlined and we have GPS tracking on our officer's cars so we know when the officer is going into a mission zone that starts a timer. Once the officer leaves the zone the timer stops. So that time frame we know we can run a quick report, supervisors at the end of the day can see that their officers completed missions, how much time they spent within those missions. So that accountability factor is important for us as a command staff to know that our officers are out there fulfilling those directives. A little bit of question to answer, so we have some questions for ourselves so that we can answer so that hopefully that minimizes the questions at the end. Uh, why is it important? It's a modernized tool uh, for forecasting where crime may occur. We have ours weighted heavily towards gun violence. Um, it's difficult to give you an exact amount, but it's about 65% of the crimes reported. It's weighted 65% heavily towards gun violence for those missions that are created. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out would be that historic versus recent, incidents that have happened within the past week, that is weighted about 50-50. So newer incidents um, over just the one week period of time versus three years worth of time, it's about 50-50. So if you have within a two block area, a couple firearm related offenses occur, you're likely to see a mission there. If you only have one or less, then it's gonna look at historical uh, data that came in through crime reports to determine if there's a need for a mission in that box. And again, as a reminder, we have about six missions in each region. The city's broken up into four regions. That's six missions per shift. So the day shift is 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. They'll have six missions in the northwest region. When the next shift comes on, that updates because ShotSpotter Connect goes, also goes off the time frame of when those incidents are occurring. And these are all crimes, but like I said, we have ours weighted towards gun violence. How were we doing this process before? I have, we have two crime analysts that are non-sworn, so not police officers that uh, map violent crimes. They map crime across the board, but specifically violent crime, and they go through and they read each one of the reports to determine of if this is a, a cause for concern. They would also use ArcGIS mapping, heat mapping, to determine where those clusters are and then go in and do a deeper dive into where we need to focus our attention. We would outline hotspots manually. Um, I was also involved in this process just for a third tier to look over and to make sure that we weren't um, policing in a biased fashion. And so this gives us that unbiased way of performing this without all the manpower hours going into it. Uh, ShotSpotter Connect does that 
um, every morning at 6 a.m. and updates itself. So uh, we don't have to use that manpower and the resources can be used elsewhere. What does success look like? That's pretty easy to describe. It's a reduce reduction in crime across the board, uh, specifically gun violence. It's very difficult to track. You can imagine how many missions. Well, I can tell you how many missions um, in the next slide, I believe it is. 6,000 missions just in three months have been out there as directives for the police officers, and the officers have done 88% completion on those missions. 45 minutes in a mission is completion, if I didn't cover that earlier. So we have had success in getting our officers buy-in and out there doing the missions. What does success look like when it comes to uh, the actual numbers? Um, First, before I get into that, I want to talk about how long we've had Connect, which is six months now that it's been up and running. The first three months were a bit clunky. Uh, we were basically beta testers for the system. Uh, two of our non-sworn employees working through some of the glitches and the problems that we saw. And so I don't feel that that data was credible. Um, now we're in a place where we're feeling comfortable, that the data bowl is accurate. And so October, November, and December, I can give you some numbers for that. Um, October, November, and December of 2020, compared to October, November, December of 2021, we saw a 7% reduction in Part 1 crimes. Moving into all firearm offenses, that same time period, we actually saw a little bit of an increase, 3% in firearm-related crimes. And then moving into critically assaulted shooting victims, October, November, December 2020, compared to 2021, 18% reduction in criminally assaulted shooting victims since we've been using ShotSpotter Connect. And I think that covers pretty much everything on this slide. If I may, I just want to interject and give you a break before Isaac goes. <clears throat> I could use a drink. So, in layman's terms, I know this has come up many, many times before, uh, especially with the bias free policing that we are uh, living by. The, when, when Dan talked about the beta testing, uh, again, uh, shout out to our IT department for being involved in this. This this was more of a, a technology issue where it was uh, ShotSpotter Connect itself um, trying to come up with interfaces, patches, etc. with our, our records management system. With that being said, I want to assure everybody when, when Dan said this is unbiased, is absolutely unbiased, we have evidence. So shell casings, fingerprints, DNA, whatever the case may be, we have a victim, a known named victim, uh, we could have witnesses and a host of other things, not just some cop driving down the street. Well, I think I heard some gunshots over there, and all of a sudden we have a mission. That is absolutely not how it, how it works. Going back three years' worth of data, uh, as Dan had discussed, all the way up until recently within the last 24 hours. They put, the Connect puts all those together, um, evaluates, and then go ahead, goes, goes ahead and assigns that mission. So these are literally credible, provable, uh, absolute, evidence-based, person-based uh, situations that we are reacting to, not a he said, she said. We put that off. Well, we have back. contact information, so our media liaison, if you have further questions about Connect, uh, please reach out to um, our media liaison and we can get those answered for you. And then we're gonna get to the next agenda item. So we'll be going into uh, what is GVI? Group Violence Intervention was implemented in 2014, and the mission of it is to unite community leaders around a common goal of stopping violence in our community and helping those that are at most risk of committing violence in our community. Who are the partners of uh, Group Violence Intervention? It's a three-pronged approach. You have the police department, you have social services, and you have the community. But we like to put the community first, police department and social services on the side because the community, this is the community's initiative. Some of the partners that we have are the Office of Community uh, Initiatives, uh, the SAVE Outreach Team at Goodwill, Goodwill Industries, the St. Joe Prose uh, Prosecutor's Office, and 25 more partners. And the SAVE Outreach Team has a total of, I think, uh, 72 social service partners. Um, it's about helping make people whole again. How do we stop the violence? What services need to be provided? And how do we stop people from dying in our community? So the how, the how portion of it is, is pretty simple. Our community is telling us what they want done, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And that's why we're doing the GVI, because they're telling us this violence is not acceptable. 
Uh, is it going to happen overnight? Obviously, since 2014, it hasn't happened overnight. But, but each year, uh, we are getting better at better at being more precise doing our interventions. So the community saying, hey, look, we want this to stop. That is our job to listen. We are only an extension of the community. Our job is to listen to what they have to say and then do what they have to say. Um, notably, if you see the second bullet point that's up there, coordinates efforts of local, state, and federal. Uh, every Thursday, we just got done with one about an hour ago, uh, we have our local law enforcement agency partners. We meet with them every Thursday at 9 o'clock. Um, so that includes all area, Mishawaka, St. Joe County, Elkhart, prosecutor's office, um, federal, uh, excise, Indiana State Police, you name it they are there we had I think 26 different representatives today um, during our meeting so that's about average 26 to I think 30 32 roughly um, so you can do the math there and see how many people are affected it's not just solely relegated to South Bend what we're finding and what they're finding is the people are being um, transients to either Mishawaka or to the county or vice versa Elkhart we've had them far down as Indianapolis Chicago obviously uh, and, and other places that, that are within the um, proverbial spoked hub that we have uh, where South Bend sits. So you have Detroit, uh, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, Indianapolis, and, and other places that are there. Uh, and that's kind of geographically where we sit. So we um, get a lot of travelers, but so do they. Um, so whether a crime is committed here and fleeing there or vice versa, this is why we have this. And they, all the other agencies are, are very uh, on board and involved with even car larcenies, catalytic converter, converter thefts, all the way up to uh, shootings. And, and when I say that, that is the priority. So we work from shootings, and then we back our way down to the, the lesser where somebody is not hurt. Um, and then lastly, so this says, draws on the expertise of social service providers. That, that's a fancy way of saying, we, the police, will stop you if you make us, but we don't want to do that. We want to help you. So when's the last time anybody may think that a cop would get out of his or her car and hand somebody a car going, look, you, you, we're dealing with you. You are going to get hurt or killed or you're going to hurt and kill somebody else. We have a way. So you could put down your guns and everything's fine. Don't shoot and kill anybody. Or on top of that, you can get services provided for you. If it's help with child support, getting a driver's license, job applications, dressing, interviews, all these things that social services does. And we do that synonymous, believe it or not. Um, we, as a police department, do that often uh, with our SAVE outreach team. Um, I, I know that seems kind of weird because I will tell you that Isaac and others, they are not snitches. I will tell you, but I have no problem telling them that something is going to happen and probably with these involved people. They have never once come back and said, oh, hey, by the way, this this guy or this gal is going to do something bad. They have never done that. Um, they, they have always intervened. So when you look at these stats and numbers, uh, I think it's phenomenal, um, so to speak, when you can't put numbers of how many things were stopped based on what they've done. And even more so when you have uh, South Bend Police Department and other agencies involved trying to stop these things before they happen. Um, I, I don't know how you put analytics to that, um, maybe this is one of those circumstances we have to go back to human nature, right? We talk to somebody as a human being and, and hopefully it works. Um, and if it doesn't, we have measures in place that unfortunately, if we have to put somebody in handcuffs and take them to jail, then that's what we'll do. Uh, if, as long as it saves their lives or somebody else's, we, we don't need any more airbrushed t-shirts going here and, and Pastor Lee and uh, Sheila and Eli going to funerals uh, in their districts or just in the city in, ge in general. And that should not be happening. So frequently asked questions, why is this strategy important? Throughout the United States, it shows that 1% of people in most cities are, 1% of the people are committed, how do you word it? Let me get back, bring it back. Um, You're saying a small, a small a number small of individuals number, are driving a large portion of, of the violence. That's exactly, a small number of individuals draw 90% of the violence in the community. And it's usually about 1%. And so we've, we get an opportunity to demonstrate that uh, we can help these individuals by doing assessment, mental health evaluations, and things of that nature. And how and how can we do this? We do it through custom notifications. And what is a custom notification? A custom notification is going to talk to an individual 
with law enforcement, social service, prosecutors, and the community saying that we know that you are involved in these gang and gun activities. We want it to stop. What can we help you? What can we do to help you get your life together and not commit violent acts in our community? And it gives them the offer of help. They have an option to be able to accept help or not accept help. And most, a lot of the times that we see those that accept help doesn't commit violence again. Those that don't help to accept help, they get the part portion when it comes down to the police doing what they have to do as far as enforcement action on those individuals. So that's what a custom notification is, and we do the choice style customs. We do we we are involved with the uh, regular customs that we do, where it's just save outreach team having a conversation with an individual at a hospital, um, and we also involve the community as well as a whole. So when we go to the next slide. You'll see the different numbers. The majority of these who receive customs did not return as a suspect or a victim in a gun violence incident, and that's huge when you look at it. So that means that we were able to get these individuals and help them eliminate their barriers and get on the right path of life. So when you look at the numbers, you'll see that it say we did 283 custom notifications. No re-entry with 73% of the individuals not being recidivism in crime. The question we always get, does GBI work? Yes. For those that want to accept services and no for those that don't want to accept services. Chief? Can you go back one, Kelsey? So there's two more things on there. I, I know this has been a point of contention for whatever with some people. I just want to be clear. All gangs are groups. No ifs, ands, or buts. Kind of like um, every every homicide, right, has murder, and every, but not every murder, no. Every murder is a homicide, but not every homicide is a murder. I know it's confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's different classifications for that. So when we talk about gangs or group, who cares? When the, when the prosecutor charges, if it meets the law criteria for a gang enhancement, then that's what the prosecutor does. Doesn't matter. But if you, if you notice on here that all gangs are groups, but not all groups are gangs. We don't go, I'm going out with a gang of my friends tonight. We go, I'm a group of my friends tonight, right? So quite frankly, it's semantics and who cares if they're called groups or gangs. And then lastly, what does success look like? I know we had hit on this before, but it's, it's obvious, zero. That's what success is. And then we don't want to have suspects, undoubtedly, and certainly not victims, but also with that is potential witnesses and those in the community that are around that maybe not come forward as witnesses, but suffering traumatic or physical effects or both based on this gun violence. Nobody seems to or tends to think about how long, how, how wide these tentacles are. And we, that, that is the reason we're doing this. It's not, it's a, it doesn't affect whoever the bullet recipient is or whoever pulled the trigger. There's a minimum of two families involved and a neighborhood and a side of town and ultimately the 44 square miles that we have in the city of South Bend because somebody knows, somebody hears about it, and that is a psychological component to everyone. I don't care who you are. Anything else you want to cover here, Isaac, before we move into uh, enforcement action? No, I think we're um, pretty good as far as we just want to emphasize those that accept the services, their recidivism is, is a high number. And so how do we help these individuals not commit crimes again, not just on the city portion or the police portion or the social service person, but us as a community helping individuals to have a better life in this community? Uh, moving into the enforcement action slide, Isaac touched on this uh, topic of an enforcement action and what is it. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to say the two primary functions of the police department, South Bend Police Department, in GVI is that data collection. It's important up front for us to identify who's at risk for gun violence. If you've been a victim or a suspect in gun violence before, that, that goes up ex exponentially the more you're involved, the more incidents you're involved in. So those are our at-risk people that we're giving referrals to our outreach team to have those custom notifications to hopefully offer them that assistance so they can stay out of future gun violence. Unfortunately, some of the violent groups and gangs don't listen to the message. Um, you don't have to accept assistance from outreach or from social services, but we do ask that they stop pulling the trigger, stop being the suspects in crimes, uh, especially gun violence crimes. Um, and some of our violent gangs don't listen to that in the city. If they are identified as the worst, the most violent group or gang in the city, then we meet monthly with that small GVI group that we just that we had earlier on the slide that involves community leaders, our outreach team, and our law enforcement partners. 
we show that data to the team and make a determination if, a, if an enforcement action needs to happen. Are they following the rules that we've laid out for them? Stop the violence. And if they're not, we, make, we basically take a vote. It's not just law enforcement stating we need to do an enforcement action, it's the entire small group. And so if everyone is not on the same page, if everyone doesn't vote that an enforcement action needs to be done, then we're not doing one. The other way an enforcement action can start is if a violent group or gang kills someone. And that doesn't matter if it's just by gun violence. We pass the message on that we don't want any violence. All violence is bad, specifically gun violence is what we're focused on with these violent groups or gangs, but we give that warning that we don't want to have to focus on a violent group. They put the spotlight on themselves, they target themselves if they're the suspects in gun violence. And unfortunately, we had to do an enforcement action last year in 2021. On average, we do about two enforcement actions a year. Last year's enforcement action took a little bit more time because it involved a homicide that the investigation was just ongoing for several months and identified more individuals involved. So the homicide took place at the end of 2020, which thrust us into an enforcement action a few months into 2021 and took us several months to, to accomplish. Generally, enforcement action can be short and swift, like two to three months, but this one was about six months. It focused on a West Side group. That group had a primary individuals involved in most of the violence. There were 10 of them. There was a secondary um, group that was identified that associated closely with them. They're all one West Side gang, but we wanted to get that intel out to our officers and our partners across our whole network. So DEA task force, ATF task force, uh, Marshall's task force, and our partnering cities and jurisdictions. Uh, that focus led to 48 arrests, either of those 10 individuals arrest charges or people closely associated with them. That spotlight was brought again up on them because of their actions. So our department did target them. They put the target on themselves. Uh, illicit guns recovered. You see 34 on this slide. And what does the impact look like? That group was responsible for 25% of the gun violence in the six months leading up to that enforcement action. After the enforcement action, we looked at six months worth of data and that group was responsible for 15%. So we did see a reduction from the enforcement action. The next slide has some links to group violence information, so if you want to do further research, there are several links, and many of these are located on our Transparency Hub, thanks to our IT team. And then for further feedback, Isaac Hunt has given us his phone number on this slide, as well as, again, our media liaison. If you have further questions, reach out to either of them, and we can get those answered for you uh, with regards to GBI. So events and engagement, um, you see one up here. This is what I was talking about before where we're going to have, when we do these quarterly uh, public safety updates, we will try to give you all the events that are occurring within that quarter. We know now that uh, meeting the mayor and team, uh, Team South Bend at the O'Brien Center, um, times are listed there. We will keep doing that. Notably, um, I, we're also going to the Near Northwest meeting. It's at, that's scheduled sometime in February. Um, any other neighborhood meeting, um, we know when they are. We just get either uh, a Teams or Zoom or whatever link to those. We can or show up in person, whatever the neighborhood association prefers. And then notably, uh, the Board of Public Safety is the third Wednesday of every month that this information on Part 1 crimes is given. Uh, sometimes during Privilege of the Floor, they will ask for some updates on um, strategies and initiatives. Uh, but notably, uh, the same thing with the council, not this this past council meeting, but the one before a couple council members had asked for some updates. Uh, what are you doing with initiatives or whatever? Um, Health and Public Safety Committee chairperson uh, Eli Wax uh, had, had reached out. We kicked it off with uh, almost all the council members uh, when we talked about Shot Spotter Connect. Um, I do apologize. I know Eli is in here, and I, I'm apologizing in advance because we, we promised that we would give that information to to uh, the, the committee first. But uh, sorry, Mayor Mayor overrides that one. Yeah, I know he's here somewhere. Um, but it, it's good. I, I'm glad he's, he's here. And there's there. again uh, Sheila and and Pastor Lee is here as well. I don't know if there's other council members, but you know we're gonna have we have the, our police academy, uh, National Night Owl, Cops and Goblins, all these things, the Police Athletic League. Um, but probably most importantly, uh, out of anything, everybody sees officers on a call at some point in time or in the grocery store or at the cleaners or whatever the case may be. Go up and introduce yourself. Say hi. 
Officers want to know that people are interested in them, even if you don't mean it. That's conversation that starts. It could be 10 seconds, it could be three minutes, it could be 30 minutes. Um, but nothing bad can come of a, of a conversation that's mutually agreed upon. And again, this is going back to the human aspect, human interest. Um, we need to get back to that, uh, all of us. Um, we challenge the officers to do the same thing as, as Dan had discussed about walking patrols in the mission zones, bicycles, we'll be doing motorcycles and all kinds of stuff. Of course, when the weather's break, weather breaks, because we don't want cops out there getting frostbite you know, in, in short order. So, and we don't want to do polar vortex stuff e either. So, um, with that, I think, Caleb, I think we're going to open up to questions, unless I think Mayor may have some finishing remarks. Yeah, just also on community engagement, uh, we, we've undergone a, a lot of reform of our public safety systems over the past couple of years, uh, notably including the revision of the use of force policy in, in uh, conjunction with our community and their input. Um, so those, those uh, reform, our, our officers have taken that on in earnest and uh, are committed to being leaders in 21st century policing practices. And so that's also a part where we need to bring the community and, and the city together uh, because this is a challenge that can only be tackled if we work, uh, work together. And, you know, this is the, as the first uh, one of these quarterly briefings, you know, we went into a little more explanation. We, we hope to streamline and be able to go through the numbers uh, a little quicker uh, in future meetings. But as you see, it, this is laying out what every team is doing uh, to, to combat the violence. So if it's the patrol uh, being proactive and trying to disrupt uh, crimes before they even uh, happen by, by going into hot spots and, and using best uh, practices of, of proactive policing, whether it's our strategic focus unit uh, working on enforcement actions on, on the worst or f our first uh, uh, groups that are engaging in, in a large proportion uh, of uh, violence in our city, or whether it's our, our investigations uh, team that's working to win for those individuals who choose not to take help uh, from, from uh, our team or uh, and, and continue to commit crime, making sure we get them off, the, we solve the crimes, get them off the streets so they can't drive further violence and also deliver justice for victims. So working across the, the board here and then of course uh, with Crime Stoppers uh, trying to uh, work with the community to make sure that we're getting the information we need to, to make our neighborhood safe. So it's a, t it's a team effort across the entire organization, different strategies in each part, but it's all part of one, uh, one goal of, of driving this violence down. So with that, we'll be happy to take questions. your expectations heading into the takeover of the homicide cases and how is reality that Well, the, the short glance at it, the reality is we have 100% solve rate right now, but that is not celebratory at all um, because these are the most complex cases that we have to contend with. Um, with that being said, um, it's not just what we um, started on October 15th. We also inherited some of the old cases that are still open. Um, as an example, for the last three years, uh, there were 53 homicides. Uh, we were given 25 cases that are still open from those homicides. So we are still um, uh, on our end assigning investigators uh, in nine of those cases. Nine, if I'm not mistaken, are going to be featured on Crime Stoppers here shortly. Um, so we're, we're looking at every one of those. Uh, so regardless of Metro homicide having a case or not, there's still people in South Bend. There still are people as well. There still are family as well. So what our team has been doing is reaching out, going back. Um, that's actually in between the homicides and the shootings that we are contending with, uh, going back and contacting uh, family members and, and sometimes starting from scratch and sometimes, most times, picking up where um, the prior Metro homicide left off. Yeah, and, and what Chief said, we're off to a good start. I yeah. mean, 100% solvability uh, in the early cases here versus roughly 50% uh, over the past three years. So, so that's a good sign. We'll, we'll see how, how the legal process, when it goes through the, the justice system, how, how it proceeds, and, and that'll be important to monitor as well. Um, but there is something that we knew coming in, uh, you know, and we explored early uh, when I took office, of uh, getting the efficiencies of bringing, the, the shooters are the same people, whether it ends up being a homicide or just uh, you know, a, a shooting that, that doesn't end in a fatality. And so having that information sharing and having that group be uh, you know, in one place 
we saw that we, we saw that a, as a potential opportunity for efficiency, and we had explored the idea of having a countywide metro shooting unit. Uh, the amount of officers that w that were required to do that uh, from from the countywide perspective just we weren't able to make that happen uh, at that time, and and then uh, with some of our shortage uh, challenges, uh, we had to make the decision, and, and here we are having it within uh, SVPD and, and the neighboring jurisdictions individually. So, um, but. Also, I think the chief can attest to, and, and uh, the other jurisdictions, the collaboration with the county and, and Mishawaka continues, and the prosecutor's office, um, even though it's not a, a countywide unit anymore. You said two of the cases were suspects identified. Does that mean not charged yet, or can't be found, or either, or somewhere between? Go ahead. They're still under investigation at this point. But they are known. So notably, too, when I said that before in our, in our let's call it law enforcement strategy session, uh, the, the prosecutor himself is in every, usually every single one of those meetings on top of that uh, to discuss, to get updates, uh, not just about GBI, but he also contends with every area agency that's involved in St. Joe County as well and uh, is, is quick to answer questions that uh, they may have or uh, um, progress on a case, charges, et cetera. Um, so it's not just simply relegated to South Bend. That's what I was saying earlier. You know, you still, it all comes back to just the amount and the level, I guess. I mean, since 2014, you know, the, the gun violence victims have almost doubled. Yeah, it's frustrating for us, too. Uh, and again, people tend to overlook uh, the trauma effect, the psychological trauma effect, not just on our community, but our officers having to contend with. So whether it's a crime scene tech, investigators themselves, uh, dealing with uh, distraught, disgruntled, combination of uh, family and friends um, that takes a toll um, and again it's not this isn't simply relegated to South Bend this happens all over nationally um, we are ex we're experiencing the pinch we have 225 officers right now um, we have uh, people in the process um, but I think I've, I've mentioned it before it's a caterpillar effect you know somebody can make an announcement that they're retiring or resigning in two weeks uh, and it takes anywhere from a year sometimes up to 18 months to get another officer to replace that person um, so it's it's extremely difficult to keep that uh, ebb and flow um, going. I think to go back to what you said, uh, numbers are on the rise since 2014 here in South Bend. That's correct, but that's also something that is going across the country. It's not something that's just here at South Bend. That's across the entire country. So um, it's a problem that every department and every community is facing. But I think it's important to say we're not we don't have to follow national trends right. we're I mean we just like a lot of communities we the community we all know who's driving the violence in our neighborhoods and that's why it's so imperative that we come together as a community and, and make sure we're all on board with all of these strategies I mean we need the community's buy-in uh, to deliver this message and make it credible we do not accept violence in our neighborhoods this is not this is not a way of life that we're just going to accept in South Bend and so um, that's kind of the ask for the community is we're, you know, you can see the, the, our, our police and GVI teams, they're, they're working their tails off. Uh, but, uh, you know, we need community buy, full community buy-in as well. And that's uh, something we know we, we've got to earn that trust and, and we've got to earn it, uh, you know, with individual interactions. But uh, that's the goal. We need everyone on board to get this down. At some point you've got to wonder, is there anything we can do to, to affect this? Obviously you never uh, give up trying, but what's been very successful, what's been maybe a little disappointing? Well, I mean, when you look at the, I mean, you look at crime, especially if you look nationally, I mean, we've had, we've had periods of high, high violent crime rates in the 90s in particular. We saw those fall uh, following the 90s, and now in the last 10 years or so, we've seen them start to rise again. And so there are a number of different pieces of that. I mean, there is a, a question of, uh, you know, access to, to firearms that, that is, there's a big one, and it's not one that the, the city has a, a lot of jurisdiction over. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's also crazy to think that at the State House, they're considering getting rid of permits uh, to carry firearms. And so that's something that's opposed by our law enforcement community, and yet our state uh, legislature continues to, to push that issue. So it's, uh, you know, no, we're all, we understand the Constitution. We all support the Constitution, Second Amendment. That's great, but uh, that shouldn't prevent us from having uh, common sense uh, measures in place to, 
make sure our communities are safe and our law enforcement officers are safe. I apologize if this was already answered, but how many um, shootings have there been this year? I know it just started, but uh, with fatalities as well. You got Gigi right now. I can hang up quickly. I believe it's 11 victims in 10 cases. Ten I think so too, but let's be sure. Um, notably, IT just not, just not, they don't just do what I talked about before. They're <laughs> trying to fix my computer as well, so that's why I'm looking over Kayla's shoulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So total incidents, we've had 55 gun-involved incidents. We've had 13 total shooting victims. One, one fatal and 12 non-fatal.